Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour to our French speakers. Uh, I'm Evgenia from Roundhill Ventures, and I would like to welcome you to our first virtual PropTech Connect event. As you might know, PropTech Connect is a monthly forum that brings together Europe's real estate ecosystem, investors, entrepreneurs, corporate players, and the public sector to discuss industry trends and challenges. Just a couple of housekeeping rules. We'll have about an hour of panel discussion and then Q&A session with the audience. But please do not hesitate to share your questions along the way in the Q&A section of Zoom. And I will make sure we cover them before the end of this webinar. We would have loved to host you today in our London office as we used to do it before COVID hit. But going virtual actually allows us to cross borders without even leaving our living rooms. Today, we have an amazing panel of speakers based in France who will share their views on COVID-19 impact on real estate in Europe. Thank you so much for joining us today. Could you please briefly introduce yourselves, maybe starting with Francois? Hello, Evgenia. Hello, everyone. So I'm uh, Francois Maril. Um, first, uh, thank you very much to, um, for the invitation to participate to this uh, webinar. Um, so I'm Francois Maril, I'm the CEO and one of the three co-founders of Unlatch. So Unlatch is a SaaS solution for property developers working on the residential real, uh, real estate market. And we provide to uh, developers uh, digital tools to help them to commercialize their uh, process um, of uh, selling uh, apartments, new built apartments. So we help them from the entry of a lead uh, in a CRM uh, until the delivery of the keys uh, at the end of the construction of the apartments with a CRM, with contract automation, contract management, and client account to follow client relationship. So at Unlatch, we are a bit more than 60 people uh, working uh, for our uh, 300 French property developers. Uh, and we launched our first project with our first client, which was Quartus on April 2018. And uh, from them, since then, we have launched more than uh, 1,000 projects uh, with uh, our clients. So I would be very happy during this webinar to talk about uh, my knowledge of uh, this uh, residential real estate market. It's okay for me. Hmm. Okay, maybe I take the lead. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks, Evgenia, for, uh, for having me. Um, very quickly, I'm, I'm Victor Caro. I'm co-founder and uh, CEO of Comet Meetings, uh, which is a French prop tech that we launched uh, over four years ago. At Comet, we're kind of convinced that we're living the most exciting time in the office market and that we're living the biggest revolution actually in 100 years. And we have developed two businesses over the last, over the last four years to address this, uh, these, these trends. First business is uh, Comet Meetings. The other one, we call it Comet Buildings. Comet, me Comet Meetings is actually uh, focused on having meeting venues. And we have developed a network of meeting venues. We have five at the moment in Paris opening two additional ones in Brussels and in Madrid over the coming month. And basically you just go to Comet meetings for a day for an offsite that you could have done outside of Paris or outside of, of the major cities, uh, taking two days and spending a ton of money. And we actually enable you to be, to feel like you're outside of the city while remaining in the city with the best possible service that you can wish for at a very affordable price. So that's the first business. And we, We've actually hosted uh, a bit more than 200,000 people uh, over the last three years since the, since the opening of the first venue. And the second uh, business is actually a year and a half old. And in this building, we're service providers partnering with uh, key landlords um, in France and soon also in Europe. And basically what we do is that we develop together with the landlords our common uh, vision about what the office of the building is, which is actually... 90% of traditional long-term lease and also 10% um, uh, of flexibility uh, on meeting venues and also on desks. Addition, uh, and in addition to this, also uh, a service for the employee because in the end of, at the end of the day, 
the real customer today is becoming the employee. And so these are the two uh, key products that we have. And we went through a series of financing. And the last financing round we, we had was in September uh, when we closed uh, uh, 30 million uh, with Innovest and, uh, and other investors. Hi, I'm uh, Etienne Chetney. I'm investment manager at uh, Roundhill Capital, um, covering the French market. Um, Roundhill Capital invests uh, primarily in housing, uh, service housing, um, notably student housing, uh, but also logistics, uh, which is our current focus for the uh, French market. Um, and we've entered the French market with an acquisition uh, in February this year. Okay, uh, hi everybody. My name is uh, Robin. I'm a um, VC investor at Idinvest and a proud shareholder of uh, Comet Meetings. Uh, we manage a 200 million euros fund uh, dedicated to, to smart city. Uh, we invest in energy, mobility, buildings, and logistics startups across the world. I'm also quite involved with the traditional real estate industry. I'm an, an independent and executive board member for some of the largest residential property developers in France and the largest uh, residential race. And I, I'm also a writer on the transformation of the, the cities. And uh, I wrote uh, seven books, uh, the latest one dedicated to the transformation of the real estate industry by new tech and changing consumer behaviors. I think that leaves me. Hello, everybody. My name is Cormac Crossan. Uh, I'm the head of global business development for the real estate vertical at Schneider Electric. Uh, Schneider Electric, for those of you that don't know, is a, a large French multinational. We have about 140,000 people across 100 countries. Uh, we're specialized in energy management and automation. You need two of those two things uh, to make buildings work. We're very, let's say, present in buildings. We're very interested in the real estate sector for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, because we have a huge, huge footprint in, the, uh, in, in real estate portfolios across the world, we estimate we have a, at least one technology uh, in seven out of every 10 buildings on the planet. Uh, and the second reason is because we have a significant portfolio of our own, so we occupy about 5 million square meters across the globe. And we're obviously interested in, and I'm personally interested in, how uh, building portfolios, including our own, can transform uh, to become more sustainable and to become more digital and deliver more value and become more human centric uh, in the coming years. I'm very excited to be in this sector. I've been in real estate for six years in different roles. And before that, I worked in the IT sector for 10 years in the data center business. And it's been very much uh, a fun journey watching the compute power of data centers being applied to real estate uh, to make it perform better and deliver better business value for all the stakeholders. So I'm looking forward to today's conversation. and I'd echo everyone else's thank you to Evgenia for organizing this. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, everyone, for these introductions. So in the past eight months, COVID-19 drastically changed the way we live and work and prompted structural changes in the real estate industry. Some asset classes have been hit the hardest, such as student housing, retail, healthcare facilities. And we hear a lot about um, the fact that COVID means the end of big cities like Paris or London, as we know it. Uh, Robin, uh, so you as you mentioned, you're very involved in traditional real estate as well as prop tech and regularly share your insights on the market trends. Uh, do you agree with this uh, statement that COVID means the end of big cities? Yes, as you mentioned, uh, since the beginning of the crisis, we have seen a lot of headlines announcing the, the death of big cities. Uh, it's quite embarrassing when you invest in smart cities. Uh, so we, we, we try to, uh, to uh, look at, at this uh, trend. Uh, the underlying uh, idea is that uh, remote work uh, makes people able to, to work everywhere and uh, well, that we, will, we are going to, to see a huge uh, relocation movement from big cities to uh, suburbs or country, uh, countryside or to, to, to tier cities in very uh, attractive location like uh, coastal, uh, coastal cities. 
uh, I think we just need to, to put this idea, which is quite uh, uh, interesting at, uh, at first in, in the, the context, uh, um, just to give you some figures. Uh, the main reason why metropolitan areas are so important now in our economy and uh, are so much uh, huge engine for, for growth, it's because of the demographics. Um, I mean, when you look at Paris, the Paris region, so the, just the, the greater Paris equivalent to, to the greater London, uh, representing like 12 million inhabitants out of the 60 million uh, of the, the French metropolitan areas. Um, uh, so, so this region represents 80% of the natural growth of the country. Uh, natural growth is the birth minus the death in, in the country. So a region with only one-fifth of the population represents four-fifths of the natural growth of the country. So to compensate this and to, to, uh, to balance such a demographic engine, you need to make thousands and even hundred of thousand people leaving this region each year for over metropolitan uh, tier two cities or suburbs or, or countryside. And it's not that happening. Uh, just to give you the, the figure, each year, uh, 20,000 households leave Paris, the Paris region to another metropolitan areas or um, uh, another region in France. So we need to, to multiply it by five, by five, six, even seven, just to imbalance the, the demographics uh, in China in, in this region. So I'm pretty sure and pretty convinced that the current crisis uh, is not the death of big cities because big cities uh, concentrate a lot of young people and these young people just have child and this can, there is a kind of very powerful uh, movement in terms of demographics and when you just take a, a brief and look at uh, the economic and business opportunities providing by, by big cities uh, I think uh, for a moment, for a month, two months, maybe a quarter, it could be interesting to uh, to, to go to another cities and work uh, from a, uh, from another location. But uh, uh, all the network you you have, you you're consuming all the network you have already built, and this consumption is not something you are able to rebuild. So you 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 constantly need to rebuild it and to reconnect with the, the people of your network. So at a time, you need to uh, come again in, uh, in the larger city to be part of this network. And last point, and it will be my, my last one, it's about school. Uh, we always consider the perspective of young um, uh, people without uh, children, but in most of these big cities, parents uh, elaborate very, very complicated uh, educative strategies for, for the children. Uh, picking up this school uh, to, to another. And it's very difficult to, to replicate this uh, schooling infrastructure in remote location as we, we can have talked these, uh, these last uh, weeks or months. Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting perspective that the cities still remain quite resilient. So let's ask our audience what they think. Uh, I'm going to launch a quick anonymous poll um, to ask you whether you would consider permanently uh, relocate outside of the big city. Uh, just one second, uh, it's out now. So if you could just uh, vote uh, one single answer on this uh, poll question. Uh, if you're using the mobile version, you will see um, the, num the um, phrase saying poll in progress that you need to click on to access the poll. Otherwise, it's a pop up that you will see now. And um, yeah, we're curious to know what you think. And uh, I see many of you already voted. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, let's just wait a couple of seconds for more responses. And um, yes, so thank you so much. I'm going to close the poll now and share the results with you. So you're able to see the results now in your pop-up um, if you're using a desktop version of Zoom and then uh, you need to click poll results if you're using the mobile version. Uh, so if you can see the results are quite dominated by um, the no answer, but still some people are undecided. Uh, would anyone from the panel would like to comment on that perhaps? Maybe some personal experiences that you would like to share? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go, I was go ahead. Say something. Go, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, okay, I'll jump in really quickly. I was going to say, um, so clearly Robin is a good salesperson. He's, he's convinced us all that we need to stay in city. I, I would tend to agree. I, I'm, I'm, I, would, uh, I would say I'm not unduly surprised to see that half of, uh, of the respondents say they wouldn't leave a big city. On top of what Robin said about education, about, um, uh, about location, et cetera, I think that the, um, and the demographic end of things I think another thing as well is you, when you analyze cities, um, I'm thinking of uh, research from people like JLL when they do their top cities program, there's also the aspect of connectivity. So people like to travel, right? People like to go places. And if you like to travel on a weekend and go to Spain and go to, you know, go on a week to, uh, to Iceland or whatever, if you're living in the middle of the, the country, it's much harder to do that than if you're living beside a major airport. So I think that there are a whole host of opportunities that are thrown up by living in these big uh, conurbations. And I, I do honestly feel that the current situation, as dramatic as it seems, is more of a speed bump uh, to, let's say, human civilization than uh, an existential seismic shift towards something else. So when I hear people saying there's a new normal, I'm curious to see what that new normal is, because we have spent millennia fashioning these cities, these places that we all gravitate towards. And I just think there's so much inertia and momentum behind the, the dynamics beneath these cities. I just can't see that changing. So I'd be inclined to agree with Robin and the, uh, and the crowd. Sorry, I tend for jumping in. No worries. Um, a lot of what Robin said was, was perfectly true. I think, I think that cities um, have huge agglomeration benefits, uh, either on a professional level or even a personal level. Um, and uh, moving out of the city uh, can have a big impact, notably for schools, even though sometimes you can find better schools uh, in some uh, regional cities uh, than in French suburbs. And my own personal experience is that I'm moving in January uh, to the uh, outer reaches of the, of the Paris region. Um, I'll still be working in Paris, uh, but given how comfortable everyone has become with remote working, um, I think the distance, uh, our perception of distance has changed. Um, you can now much more easily be an hour from Paris. You know you're not going to commute every single day. Uh, you can still plan for any meeting in Paris. You can still reach uh, the airport to travel just about uh, everywhere. Uh, and you get uh, in exchange of this slight inconvenience with uh, uh, your commute, uh, a much better quality of life. And it's definitely not for young people, but for families with kids, uh, it's a big temptation. Um, and so far, we've only seen anecdotal evidence, uh, but we might see an impact, a uh, small impact on prices in the coming months, especially as the remote working policies uh, for the French companies um, take a definitive view of how much more flexible uh, they're becoming, not just the short term, how do we deal with COVID uh, impact. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so we'll probably only see in a few months time whether there has been any material change in consumer demand. It is probably still too early to uh, have any um, real statistics on that point. And Francois, uh, for example, what about the new built uh, residential real estate? Do you see any changes since the beginning of uh, pandemic in that sector? Uh, yes, uh, a huge uh, change. Um, it's not only part of the, of the COVID-19. Um, it's the, the, the COVID the crisis. Um, uh, expand uh, this this uh, this crisis of a new built residential uh, real estate market. Uh, the problem was uh, the municipal uh, elections uh, that was supposed to uh, happen uh, in March 2020. So uh, mayors uh, were more reticent to deliver uh, construction permits uh, before uh, the election. Uh, so. Already in 2019, we saw that uh, uh, new projects uh, were done by 20% uh, compared to 2018. And so in 2020, 
the, the fact that the, the election was postponed to, to June uh, make uh, this uh, uh, deliver, deliverance of uh, construction permits uh, postponed as well. Uh, and so uh, the COVID-19 has this impact of uh, postponed these uh, elections. So for the first semester of 2020, uh, the market of new projects was done by uh, 50, nearly 50% 50 uh, compared to uh, the first semester of uh, 2019. And today, the French uh, Federation of uh, Property Developers, the FPE, just released their analysis for the third uh, quarter of 2020. And it was done, it's done uh, by 40%, uh, 37% uh, compared to um, last quarter of uh, the same quarter last year. So this uh, crisis had a huge impact uh, on uh, property developers. Uh, they, they don't have uh, the, 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 the construction permits uh, delivered by the mayors. Uh, and there are also new uh, mayors. For, since June, there are new mayors uh, in, the, in the, these different cities. Uh, in big cities, there are a lot of uh, uh, ecology, uh, green uh, mayors uh, that want to um, that want to to, to uh, rethink and to uh, give uh, their opinion on the permit that was already uh, in the. Um, nearly uh, to be signed before in the projects that was to be signed and to be uh, to be allowed before the, the, the elections. And so they postponed the, the deliverance of uh, construction permits. So there is a huge impact on supply for uh, this uh, residential uh, new brick real, real estate market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. So we really need to think about not only direct impact of COVID on the market, but also indirect, such as, as you yeah. said, the impact of uh, delay in, in elections and construction permits. Yeah, it has an impact on the supply and on the demand as well, because uh, individuals, um, it's more difficult for individuals to have access to, to loans uh, because uh, uh, banks are more strict on, uh, uh, on, the, on the loans. So they are more strict to deliver these loans. Um, and so the demand as well is very impact. So both supply and demand, it's difficult for, for property developers. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, if we talk about one real estate sector that uh, must have benefited from COVID, uh, such as logistics, um, Etienne, could you share with us uh, maybe some uh, trends you're seeing in the logistics sector in Europe? Yes, I mean, the immediate impact on, on, on logistics um, was a bit negative. The take up was, was down. Uh, some tenants, especially the smaller tenants, had difficulties paying their rent. Um, at some point, everyone was delaying paying their invoices, which started um, a bit of a negative trend. Uh, but that was quickly corrected with the state-backed loans, uh, the, the PGE. Um, then the crisis was quite good for logistics. Uh, it benefited from an improved image as the backbone of the, of the real economy. People were scared of not having enough food and uh, toilet paper in the supermarkets, but uh, the logistics and supply chain were able to satisfy all of those needs. Um, it also boosted uh, e-commerce. Um, in the EU27, um, e-commerce increased by 30% in uh, April uh, compared to the year before, whereas uh, brick and mortar retail fell by, uh, fell by 18%. Um, and this is not only a short-term impact, it's also a lot of new customers uh, who had to try e-commerce um, from scratch or just expanding the range of products that they're using. And that will result in a long-lasting increase, in, uh, increase in demand. Um, also, uh, the borders uh, shutdown had the impact of making a lot of people rethink their supply chain um, doing more onshoring, nearshoring, um, also adding a bit of slack in the supply chain, um, which means increased requirement uh, for big box logistics just to store a bit more goods. Um, and all of that is, is pretty good for logistics. However, the economy is still suffering uh, 
uh, and there'll be a bit uh, of, a, of a negative impact in logistics. Uh, we're not completely floating above the real economy. Uh, we're really a part of it. Uh, so while we've avoided uh, as a short-term impact, if the economy doesn't uh, rebound significantly, uh, we'll be dragged down by it. Yes, um, very interesting, uh, especially your points about the um, onshoring of the supply chain and um, new challenges that logistics real estate owners are facing. Um, and probably uh, another topic that we all really affected by now is work from home. So uh, what does the future hold for commercial real estate and offices? Uh, maybe before addressing this question to our panelists, I would like again to ask the opinion of our audience. Uh, by launching another anonymous poll. So would you prefer to work from home or work in the office or a hybrid model of both modes? I'll give you a few seconds to respond. We have many people who already voted. And the panelists can vote too, of course. Yeah, we, we, we miss a Comet meetings option, I guess. <laughs> Well, I would probably put it in the hybrid, right? Um, so I think uh, many of you have voted and I'll share the results with you right now. Uh, so you can see that the big, big majority of our audience prefers the hybrid. And um, I think that reflects the feeling that many of us have that despite the certain advantages of working from home, offices still provide a vital role in culture, community, and connection between people. Um, so would you like to share your view on this, Victor? I'm sure you have <laughs> interesting points to say on that. Yeah, sure. Thanks for, for letting me. Um, well, I think it's a fascinating topic, and I really love the answer and the fact that it's so uh, strongly on the going towards the answer number three. Um, basically, if we want to take a look at what's happening currently in the, in the office market, we need to take a look at the big revolution, which is uh, uh, unraveling, and actually the two crises that we're living. Because we're not only living the pandemic crisis, we're, we're not only living the COVID-19 crisis, we're also living the upcoming economic crisis. And when we take a look at what's actually happening and, and what, is dri what these two crises are driving, it's interesting to take a look at the, the different um, directions towards which it's, it's pushing us. The, um, the COVID crisis is actually letting us know that we can ask ourselves if we actually need to go to the office and if we can actually not be only doing what was, uh, I think it was option number one, which is working from, working from home. So we can kind of question the, the, the status quo, which had never been questioned before to such an extent, which is, do we actually need offices? The economic crisis is actually bringing another question, which is that when you take a look at the PNL of a regular company, the office, the, the, the lease cost represents between the, the second and the third um, uh, major cost in the PNL of a company. So obviously, whenever uh, arriving into a downturn, we're all wondering for our companies, what do we do? What can we flexibilize? What can we reduce? And so basically, these two trends are putting into question the, the essence of the office and wondering if we actually need to have them. And when we deep dive on this question, I think it brings another question, which is what actually, what is actually work and what do we actually do at work? And what we can see is that at work, at least what I've felt during this year, and I think I'm, I'm not the only one here, is that we do not one thing, but three things at work, at the office. We produce, so basically we need to work on something by ourselves um, and these, we do it better when we're actually not at the office and not when, when Michel or, or Joanne is asking us to go and, and grab a coffee. We collaborate. And this usually we do it before and after tasks of production. And this is way easier to do it in the same physical space. Although with the tools which are, which are being developed, we can also do it partly, but only partly um, uh, distantly, remotely. And the third thing, which we tend to talk more and more, but which was kind of... A, um, under the carpet before is that when we go to the office, we bond. And what does it mean? We actually socialize and we create something which is kind of bigger than us. And we create a sense of community and we strengthen this community. And this community is actually the reason why we will switch jobs or we will stay. It's not the only reason, but it's a key reason. And this thing 
strengthening and keeping the bond between each other in, in, a, in a given company, it's extremely hard to do it when we're not at the same place. So basically, what's happening today is that in the, in the office markets, we're able to think about different models. And there is not only the model that we used to have, the traditional model, and which will probably remain one of the key models, which is, I have offices, me as employer, I have offices and I ask my company and every one of my employees to go to the office four to five days a week. Well, there is this model, but there will, but other models are emerging. And the other models are actually the ones that you were mentioning in the question. You have the extreme model, which is, I don't have work, I don't have a workplace anymore and my workplace is actually my couch. Well, okay, we see the benefits of it and we also see the limits of it. And companies which will decide on an hybrid model, a model being two to three days of work from home, two to three days of work from the office. And the main thing that we need to have in mind is that depending on the situation, depending on the company, the industry, different choices will be made. And I don't think there is a better choice than the other one. The thing that we need to, to take into account is that depending on the choice, the key question and the key challenge will be different. For companies, if I just take the two extremes, for companies, for companies which remain in the traditional model, the key challenge will be to explain to their employees why they need, why they're asking uh, of their employees to go to the office, while competitors actually give more flexibility. And so the, the answer will be essentially to bring something more at the office than what we have uh, in our couch. Um, and so basically, it's how can we add service for the employees so that when he goes to the office, if I put the point very simply, how does he have the feeling that he's going to work at Google rather than working at company A? The other companies, companies that will, that will essentially go towards a model which is um, um, remote first and no offices or almost no offices will face another problem, which is a culture problem. How do I strengthen the link? And here they will need to actually not add service to offices that they don't have anymore, but they will need to see them, to see and to meet the team, to gather the team way more often than they used to, which was maybe two to three times a year. So this is kind of what I'm seeing and what we're seeing at Comet um, going, uh, going forward. And so basically, just to answer uh, um, the point of, of Robin, actually Comet can obviously help on the model, on the hybrid model, but also on the other two models with the two branches, with the two business legs that was mentioning you uh, at first. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. That's very interesting. So it means that offices um, are really need to be reimagined and we need to really cha change our um, the way we think about work patterns and how people interact in the offices. So what does it mean for the um, owners of uh, office um, real estate? Um, could you give, me, give us maybe some examples of uh, what can be done to make this um, uh, properties more attractive for this new mode of working? Mm. Yes, and I think they have, um, they have different responsibilities. Landers have different responsibilities. There is, of course, a short-term responsibility, which is safety and health. Okay, we need to ensure that the, the buildings are, are, are safe in a COVID-19 uh, time. But when we take a look, a look forward, a look maybe one year from now, um, I think that depending on the model, we, we could think that landlords will, will only have a role to play in the model A, in model of traditional offices. And I think, of course, they will have to because the, the key thing to take into account is that the needs of the tenants will become the needs, will become, will become the obligations for the landlord. And so basically the services that you can bring as, uh, as um, a landlord to your tenants and tenants to the employees will be everything that you can have on your daily, uh, on your daily path as an employee. So how do you rethink about the welcome in the, in the building? How do you rethink? How do you create social places, um, social spots where you, where you have events actually, so that you feel you can not only bump into, into, uh, into your coworker at the coffee machine, but, but also during events. How do you also bring wellness into the workplace? How do you ensure that you have different food and beverage, but like snacking areas where you will actually be happy to take a, a short break, which more, way more efficient than if you just went downstairs to buy something, et cetera. And also how do you create workspaces, meeting rooms and desks where you can actually go and work um, to have a different position during the, uh, during the day. So this is the number one challenge for the, for the lender. I think, I think it's to realize that 
the model that they used to be in before, which was a great model. I don't need to provide any service if I'm being bold to my tenants and it's fine. But I think the first challenge is to realize that this model is not enough and that they need to bring with operators or by themselves, they need to bring more service. But I think that their role goes a little bit further and I will finish with this. I think that basically companies that will move from the traditional model, so tenants which will move from traditional model to hybrid model, I think that these tenants can also be, uh, can also be kept by the landlords if these also help them not only on the lease surfaces that they will provide to them, but also on the flexibility offer and kind of packaging something, packaging a, um, a bulk offer to tell them, look, I understand. I'm not only trying to sell you a lease and a 12 year lease. I understand I will sell you a 12 year lease or six year lease, but I'm actually also selling you what you actually need, which is also flexibility. So my point is just to say that as, um, as, a, um, as an office owner, as a landlord, I don't think that it's because you deny, it's because you don't take into account the fact that, that your tenant is asking for flexibility and for hybridation. And it's not by not answering to this need of hybridation that the need will disappear. It's actually only the tenant that will disappear and it will go somewhere else. Right. Um, and um, so it seems like flexibility is really, uh, <clears throat> will be key in many areas and in particular in commercial real estate and offices. Uh, so, uh, Kermak, what is your view? Because I think you have also a lot of use cases uh, in commercial real estate owners and the challenges they are facing these days. Yes, uh, thank you, Evgenia. So I, I have a sore neck from nodding to everything that Victor said. So, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more with what he said. I was interested to see the response to the, uh, the survey on what people expect. Do they want full-time work from home or full-time in the office? And I think... Um, the unanimous response for uh, a mix or for choice uh, is reflected in pretty much every survey to corporate occupiers we're looking at today. So every day I read a new one, but nobody wants to work from home all the time and nobody, virtually nobody wants to work in the office all the time anymore. So what Victor said about choice and flexibility, I'd agree wholeheartedly with. Um, I think I mentioned the fact that I don't think it's an existential crisis for the for the commercial real estate sector. I do think, however, it's a, it is a time which is rich in opportunity uh, because the increased demand for flexibility that we will see from corporate occupiers opens up the opportunity for new possibilities of intermediation. So we've had, uh, we've had WeWork for many years now and other co-working uh, companies. I can see an opportunity for companies to come in, like what Victor is saying, uh, to, to come in and solve that as a problem and start to move towards something that we've seen in the technology sector for some time, which is moving towards uh, subscription-based models and pay-as-you-go. Uh, and I can see that coming in very, uh, very strongly. Um, the, it is impossible to have a crystal ball and to say how this is all really going to pay out, right? E even if you look at the top five technology companies in the US, right? The GANFA, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon. You just need to take a look at what the CEOs are saying. Why do we listen to them? Well, typically they've been bellwethers, right? As far as corporate occupiers go. So they're a good indication as major consumers of square footage. They're a good indication of what the current thinking is, what the zeitgeist is as, as terms of, in terms of the corporate occupiers. Well, you clearly have two camps, right? You have Zuckerberg uh, on one side, maybe Dorsey from Twitter as well, but we have Zuckerberg on one side who said, yeah, it's going to be remote working, you know, as a standard from now on. And on the other side, you've Satya Nadella uh, and you've also the, the CEO of Google, who are both very, very measured in their uh, adoption of remote working. Amazing. When you think about it, these Google and Microsoft, two of the biggest enablers of working from home, are very, very careful about what the potential of full time and 100 percent usage of their own tools are. Um, uh, um, so um, Sundar from Google says he's wondering what it will look like when you start, you know, remote working is okay for a while, but what happens when you start a new project with people you don't know, um, new team, new objectives, what happens when new arrivals come into the company, that's something you mentioned, Victor, where does the notion of company culture, corporate culture get, you know, built out, so that's, that's an issue. 
And Satya Nadella from uh, Microsoft said, he, he wonders if, uh, this is a quote from April, are we just burning the social capital that we have accumulated over several years? What happens when that runs out? So I think that the, I'm pretty much echoing what Victor says. I think that there's, uh, the, if, I can, if I can paraphrase what somebody, what, what Mark Twain said, the rumors of the death of the office are greatly exaggerated. Uh, I, I definitely don't think it's the end of commercial real estate, but I think um, we're definitely moving towards an, a time when there'd be increased choice. And this is borne out from the discussions that we at Schneider are having with some of our bigger uh, clients. The discussions that we're having now are not let's close our properties. The discussions are how do we make our properties ready for the next step? How do we make them uh, more sustainable? That's one thing. Sustainability as a as a as a uh, as a, as a, obviously a, a huge challenge. How do we make them more resilient? So we have this pandemic is a crisis. There will be lots of other crises, right? There are there is uh, increased bad weather. There's uh, problems with the electricity grid. Um, many things are happening that we need to be able to respond to better. And I think that the pandemic has taught us that we need to build in a little bit more resilience in our property portfolios than maybe previously. And so um, uh, when you ask me what the outlook is, yes, one word, choice. Uh, people want choice. And the companies that are able to navigate that and able to provide that choice to corporate occupiers, I think will do very, very well uh, in, the coming, in the coming years. Right, and so you mentioned sustainability, which ties nicely into kind of my uh, next question. So how have you seen COVID really accelerated this uh, trend? Uh, do you see uh, both in terms of um, real estate owners and tenants, uh, the trend towards choosing more sustainable buildings, more green buildings? Um, is this something you've seen so far? Uh, yes. So in a word, yes, yes. It's been uh, quite incredible, the momentum that has built behind sustainability and net zero since the beginning of the year. Um, I think it precedes, uh, it precedes COVID somewhat. Um, so I think one very important date in the calendar for sustainability was the, the World Economic Forum at Davos this year, where there was a huge focus on net zero and sustainability. Greta Thunberg was there. But on the back of that, we've heard some really, really interesting sound bites from the global real estate investment community and beyond. Um, we have Larry Fink from BlackRock, who in virtually every letter and message to his shareholders has been talking about net zero, has been talking about sustainability. Um, in one message, he said that sustainable assets are outperforming every other asset class, even during the pandemic. I think that's a clear uh, indication as to the underlying trend here. And the underlying trend is we, again, go back to what Francois was talking about, demand. Uh, if you look at the demand side in real estate, corporate occupiers are looking for green buildings. They have many of them increasingly uh, signed up to things like RE100, carbon exposure projects, science-based targets, and they are looking to occupy buildings that are green and they will not accept to move into a building that doesn't hit a certain number of standards. It's no longer, I think the, the age of what we used to call greenwashing is very much gone, right? Um, there's a term that was coined a couple of years ago, carbon stranded assets. Um, and I really think that we're getting into that stage, to that stage now where um, if your portfolio does not hit a su sufficient number of uh, key metrics from a sustainability perspective, you do run a serious risk of not being able to sell that space, either rent it or indeed move it on at a reasonable price if you wish to divest. So, so we're at our level. I mean, just to give you an idea, we have uh, we have a sustainability practice in Schneider. We have about 2,700 energy professionals who consult uh, to corporate occupiers and corporates across the world. Uh, we, we manage a 30 billion euro energy spend for some of those uh, companies. And we get a lot of questions about this, and we're definitely seeing a surge, if you pardon the electrical pun, <laughs> we're seeing a surge of demand and push towards sustainability, carbon reporting across scopes one, two, and three, the whole nine yards. And um, this, this has only accelerated uh, during, the, during the crisis. People are asking themselves the question, which is kind of good, we're reopening our buildings, we need to change things, 
but we need to address the sustainability issue at the same time. So we're seeing companies addressing these uh, multiple topics, healthy building as well, but sustainability at the same time. And that's across all geographies. Interesting. And um, what about the sustainability trend in the city's urban planning? Uh, for example, Robin, I know you um, talk a lot about the micromobility trends and smart and sustainable cities. Is there, do you see the same trends as Cormac was uh, mentioning um, on the urban planning and development um, uh, sector as well? Yes, uh, as a smart city investor, we invest uh, in uh, prop tech and real estate tech startup, but also in um, mobility and logistics uh, startups. We're investor uh, in uh, each uh, in uh, Bird, the e scooter uh, company. Uh, so we have seen the, the the dramatic shift uh, in the usage of uh, mobility uh, over the, the, the last six uh, months. Uh, as most of the trends uh, with, with, the, with the crisis and the lockdown, uh, it was present before the crisis. I, I mean, the, the crisis, the lockdown, uh, has just, have just speed up uh, movement was, was underlying in, in the society. But it's crazy when, when you look at the, at the, at the stats uh, regarding the, the use of uh, the cycling in, in Paris, but also in, uh, in, uh, in cities like Warsaw. In Warsaw, the, the, the number of uh, cycling rides uh, have been uh, increased by threefold since, uh, since January. So it's, uh, it's not only uh, a trend in a very uh, large, the largest uh, metropolitan, uh, areas, I think it's also a real deep movement in uh, all our countries, and um, local authorities have decided to to, to take uh, to to take this movement this movement uh, uh, really um, really strongly, and uh, we have seen a lot of initiative in in Paris with uh, uh, the ambition to uh, double and even triple the, the number of. Uh, uh, bicycling uh, lanes, uh, but also car-free initiative in a lot of uh, cities. Uh, I think, uh, for for instance, in uh, in Manhattan, in New York, where the the car-free uh, initiative uh, really helped to to save lots of retail and restaurants, uh, give, giving them the uh, outdoor spaces uh, needed to to operate during the, the summer and uh, and the autumn. And I think it's uh, something that uh, will last uh, the the current uh, crisis. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's also one of the reasons why I'm uh, so a strong believer in the future of city. I think uh, the more city will be able to uh, turn off uh, uh, the um, damages or the setbacks of the cars. I mean, congestion, pollution, and noise. Uh, if cities are able, and especially the center of the cities are able uh, to get away, to rid of these uh, three uh, problems, uh, I think uh, there will be a tremendous uh, uh, opportunity for, for, for the cities because uh, the assets in such city centers are very rare. And uh, if uh, uh, they, they are able to not be uh, disturbed by uh, this, um, this, um, these problems, uh, I think the, the value of these assets will increase a lot. Yes, thank you for that. So uh, the sustainability trend, as both uh, you, Robin and Carmack mentioned, that it was already there before, but now it's even more urgent. And uh, it really was accelerated by COVID. Uh, another point is probably what we've seen so far is the really need for traditional real estate players to invest more in digital capabilities. And um, for instance, in um, residential space, uh, Francois, what have you seen? Um, about the adoption of digital tools by traditional real estate developers um, since the beginning of the crisis? Well, the, the first lockdown was um, uh, very efficient for us because we cannot move, nobody could uh, move uh, at this moment. So um, uh, property developers, if they wanted to sell um, the apartments, so to typically to, to sign a contract with our clients, they, they had to, to use um, digital tools. Um, it's a business sector that was not well known to be an early adopter sector. Uh, so this crisis uh, forced them to, 
to use uh, these new digital tools to be able to work because they couldn't have uh, new uh, building permits. Uh, during the beginning of the crisis of the first lockdown, they could not, couldn't start their, uh, their projects to, to be to, to construction of the, pro of the projects. So what remained to, to them at the beginning was, okay, I've got some, uh, uh, some projects and I, I need to sell them. So, um, so they had to, to digitize themselves. So that's why we, we saw for us at Unlatch, we saw uh, an increase of new clients. Um, we, we signed more new clients during the second quarter of 2020 uh, than for the, than at the, the first quarter. Uh, but uh, as they didn't, they, 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 they couldn't uh, launch new projects because these projects were, were locked down by the, the building permits. Um, we saw that a lot of these clients gave us their older projects that was already um, uh, launched and that they had still, they still for, for those, they, they still had some apartments to sell. Uh, and then they, they gave us those, those projects, those, those uh, projects to, to put on a latch to be able to sell the two or three remaining apartments um, they, they had. So they, 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 they took the opportunity of the lockdown to digitize themselves and to uh, to 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 to, uh, to keep to to, to, um, to have new um, new product like like Unlatch to be able to still to 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 keep working. That's what we we saw. This second lockdown is quite different because you can still work, you are still able to go to see your clients, uh, to sign your contracts, um, but you want your employees to be safe. You don't want them to go and travel all around the country. Uh, so still, um, we see that utilization of um, uh, digital tools and of uh, digital signatures uh, are much more used during this lockdown than it was um, in uh, last year. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And Etienne, uh, for example, how was the experience of going more digital from the perspective of a real estate player such as Round Hill Capital? And how has your work changed over the past few months? Well, it, it uh, both for the first lockdown and, and the second, um, uh, leasing brokers activity has been uh, uh, made very complicated because most legally they're not allowed to organize property visits, uh, for example. Um, and even though you can now have, uh, you know, virtual visits, which are very, uh, very efficient, um, no one will commit to lease an apartment uh, or, you know, even let's buy an apartment um, or lease a, a, a warehouse if they haven't visited it and explored it. Uh, so it there's some things in real estate that you can't, uh, you can't replace with technology. Um, however, on a day-to-day -day basis for admin stuff, uh, people have been increasingly uh, at ease uh, using electronic signature um, and uh, exchanging all matters of, of document electronically. Um, but that's we're just perfecting this. Uh, it's it's nothing uh, absolutely new. Uh, it's just a normal adaptation. Uh, but not everything in real estate um, uh, can be solved by uh, technology. People need to be able to uh, uh, to move, um, and and COVID is a very good test of what we can do, um, and it has shown tremendous improvements. Uh, but technology is not the be all and the be all and end all. Right. So yes, as you mentioned, so the digital capabilities can make uh, processes more efficient, but they can't uh, completely replace them. And what about the um, office space? Uh, Victor, could you give us maybe some examples of how digitalization um, was going in that space and maybe some projects you're working on uh, with some of your clients? Yeah, sure. Uh, I could tell you two things. I could tell you uh, the first, which is what we actually do at Comet Meetings, uh, given the fact that our meeting venues are currently closed and what we do to digitalize uh, ourselves. But I will especially tell you about the second point about the landlord. On the first one, we've actually very simply developed a hybrid platform so that our customers can continue meeting, even though it's remote at 100%, but while having still the same level of service from Comet, be it to make sure that technology works, 
that we can help them with the content of their meetings, also helping them structure and go through the meetings so, so that it's a real success. And also uh, making sure that like the food and beverage is fine, et cetera. So this, we, 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 this is a change that we've made to our product so that um, we can currently face the situation and so that later we will be able to better deal with the hybridation of meetings. This is one thing, but I think that what's very interesting on the, on the office market is to see the tremendous change that has been already um, unraveling on the, on the side of the landlords. Because if I can give you a quick example, I was mentioning to you the second business we have, Comet Buildings. So how do we partner with lenders to add service? This, we have seen an increase by a factor five. So five times more, we're looking currently at five, five times more um, uh, possibilities, opportunities, um, uh, buildings as we used to nine months ago. So basically, this is a huge increase because lenders have realized that they need to add this service. They need to provide flexibility. So this has been a major trend. But also, I think that's a key difference. Uh, and we were mentioning, come back in particular, you are mentioning uh, WeWork a bit before. I think the other thing that has been changing also in the mind of the landlords is that when you contract with a traditional co-worker, you get intermedi intermediated, basically. While what we offer to landlords is actually to operate with them, so to partner. And we're not saying, look, guys, there is some value to create and some value to capture. Uh, we tell, and, and then uh, give us a lease, and then we will take all of the value and keep it for ourselves. This is not the model we've chosen. We've chosen the model where we say, let's partner. Let's take a look at what's the maximum value we can create, and then let's divide it fairly between you and us. So yes, I think the increase has been um, it's exponential this year. Right, and uh, do you want to give us maybe some examples on the um, uh, projects for some big corporate clients that you're working on? Or yeah, sure, sure. Um, we used to work only with landlords, and now we have also tenants, big tenants, coming to us and telling us, "Look, guys, I have this campus, I have this huge building. What can I do there?" Uh, but if I can give you two examples, maybe one example, well, two examples with landlords. One, which is um, the first one, one we signed which is a 70,000 square meters tower uh, owned by Goldman Sachs and Altaria, uh, which is in La Défense, uh, the landscape tower, tower. And there we are designing and we will operate starting next year uh, between four and 5,000 square meters of service. And there you will have shared meetings, meeting rooms between all of the tenants of the, um, of, the, of the asset, because basically meeting rooms are usually very inefficient and very, uh, very badly uh, used, utilized. So uh, meeting rooms that will operate and that we will be able to be booked through uh, our app, through the, through the Comet app that we call Cosmos. So we'll be able to book your meeting room, to book your service, um, to book uh, a latte, for instance, if you want to have it at the barista corner, which is also uh, something we will be operating, etc. And so on. How can we operate meeting rooms, operate also uh, everything that will make your life as an employee uh, close to incredible at, at the office. That's one, one, but here it's only in closed loop. So basically the service is only accessible for the uh, users of the asset. And now we're about to sign another major um, deal where all of these services are actually in paper use. So basically you can have customers coming from the inside or the outside, and you also have you also have um, flex desks. So you also have a part of co-working um, alongside with the meeting and the service. And I think this is kind of close to uh, what the building of the future will look like. 90% of long-term lease, 10% or between 10 to 10 to 20% of flexibility and service. Yeah, very interesting. And maybe to add uh, to that, um, Cormac, I know you've been working a lot on smart and sustainable solutions for uh, real estate owners. So could you maybe share with us some of the um, main things you, you're working on, for example, in terms of data analytics or IoT or sensors? So what, what is um, kind of the main um, challenge and solution that uh, you're providing these days? Yeah, sure. No, no problem. Very interesting listening to, um, uh, to what the other panelists have to say about this. Um, so I guess um, at Schneider, we certainly think that we're, we're, we're in, the, in, the, in the process of going through a seismic change in the real estate sector, right? So it's, uh, real estate moves slowly and that's normal, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, we have an expression in English, we say something is set in stone, it's for a reason, right? It takes a long time for things to change, but 
I think we're seeing huge uptake in uh, certain types of technology that can be applied to uh, to buildings. So Etienne, you rightly said digital is not like a silver bullet, right? It can't solve every problem. There are some problems that it's remarkably efficient at solving. So I'll give you one example. Um, so buildings today are very, very energy intensive, right? So they, they use up approximately, depends which report you read, anything between 30 and 40% of the world's energy footprint uh, is, uh, is constituted by the built environment. And buildings today are extraordinarily inefficient, right? So there's a, there's a report, it's a few years old, but it, it talks about, it's from the International Energy uh, Agency, IEA, and it talks about there is a day in the future when buildings will be 100% efficient, right? So there's an economic potential between, which rep is represented or behind 100% efficiency in, uh, in the built environment. And if you look at the industrials and manufacturing sector, they are halfway through that journey. So they're 50% the way there because they've, they've started the journey a lot earlier. Um, if you look at commercial real estate, we're about 18, 1.8%. So we have 82% of the economic potential of efficiencies in buildings that we can still pursue. Uh, and the good news is that the technology to do that today exists, right? So it's actually very, very simple. Buildings produce vast amounts of data. You know, most of that data is just sitting in the building doing nothing, right? It's, not, it's sitting in siloed systems. And what we can do now is we can, we can basically connect all the systems in a building to the cloud, we have analytics and algorithms sitting in the cloud that can be can be directed at this data and can give us insights into how we can actually improve uh, the performance of the building, drive down that operating cost. Corporate occupiers are happy because their their top their costs are going down, their energy costs are going down, their maintenance costs are going down. FMs are happy because their their corporate occupier clients are happier. Landlords are happy because of a well-performing building. So there's a lot of upside to be got simply by applying, we call it internet of things, right? So it's, uh, it's uh, simple sensors that you would instrument across an entire building, gathering information about the, about the building, and then throwing that data up to the cloud where it can be properly processed and managed to generate insights. And that single phenomenon, right? I'm, over, I'm very, very, oversimplifying what happens because there's a way more complexity involved than that but basically that's it take the data from the building up to the cloud crunch it send it back down turn it into actions you can save massive 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 amounts of money i think the stakes that we're seeing are the following uh, buildings are becoming increasingly transparent in terms of their operating uh, costs right so we're already seeing um digitized versions of the LEED certification, right? So you may know this, I'm sure many of you do. Uh, you can, a building can be LEED certified and it's typically a benchmark as to how efficient your building is. And, and it has a direct, uh, according to research that we've seen and I can share with you afterwards, there's a direct impact on asset value. There's also a direct impact uh, by extension on the amount of rent that you can get for a facility that's LEED certified. But what's happening with LEED? Interesting, right? Previously, it was completely manual reporting. So you collate data locally and then you send it to LEED and then they'll tell you, if you what level your building's at. Now, what we're seeing is very interesting. Uh, LEED of a digital platform which collects the data in real time. So we have a building, for example, in Grenoble, our own building, which is reporting in real time its performance to, uh, to, to LEED, right? And we think that this is the way it's going to go, right? So we're, if you look at everywhere else in the... Every other sector, digital means transparency. Transparency is scary in real estate, but it's coming. Uh, and so you're gonna get buildings talking about how, talking, communicating, right? How they are performing. And that will become um, one other decision criteria along with your, your, your location, location, location that you guys always talk about. It'll become another criteria, selection criteria for corporate occupiers. So there's going, there is a race starting now to optimize buildings, to connect them, to apply the digital technology that exists today. I'm very excited about this. You can probably get that from the way I talk, but I am excited about this because the all the technology, all the components, right? All the ingredients for this recipe, this great cake that we're baking, they all exist. And the only thing that doesn't exist is, uh, I would say the integration layer that we're slowly working towards, right? 
if you can imagine, uh, this is this is where we were with the smartphone in about 2005, right? So we we haven't launched the smartphone yet, the fully smart building, the uh, you know the cognitive autonomous intuitive building doesn't yet exist. But just like Steve Jobs with the iPhone in 2007, all of the individual components that made up that first iPhone, they've already been invented, right? We have the equivalent of this, the touch screen, the camera, the OS, everything is already there. It's just a matter of getting to that level of integration. And funnily enough, that is not a technology issue. It's actually an ecosystem issue. It's about the way that we, the way that buildings actually happen, the way that buildings get made through the entire ecosystem, starting with architects, developers, consultants, et cetera. And we're bar we are, all of us here, I believe, and everybody listens to this call, we are part of a conversation that is moving us inexorably towards this future, right? Towards a smartphone-like building, right? An eye building where, um, and it echoes, I think, something that Victor said, um, where your square meter will no longer be a square meter. It will be a square meter carrying a number of included integrated services uh, that will deliver value to, uh, to the corporate occupier and probably more importantly to the occupants themselves, making them sticky uh, and helping those people to be more productive and to come in more often. And I think that's really where, uh, where technology is driving us now. So we're, your question, uh, Evgenia, was what kind of conversations are we having? Lots of conversations around that. Lots of conversations around how do we have mobile applications that connect to the building and can advertise and promote all the services that we have in the building and can have provide a seamless experience to people in the building. It's always the right temperature for them. Doors open by themselves, touchless. There's huge conversations around that because of COVID. And so, yeah, the, the conversations that we're having, all of them, all of them gravitate towards digital and how digital uh, enables the sustainability question, but not just that. Healthy buildings and human-centric, highly experiential, highly sophisticated buildings. Very, very positive and positive times for us. And I know a lot of prop techs listening to this, there's huge, huge potential for the prop techs, you guys, you start up listening to this, areas where you can innovate around this, there's a multitude of, uh, of ways you can do that. And at Schneider, we're very happy to work together with you guys. I'll talk about that hopefully in a second, if we have time. Thanks, Evgeny, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Carmack. Um, so as a bottom line, if I understand right, the smart and sustainable buildings are no longer a nice to have, but it's a must have, right? I would, yeah, I would say so. I think it's becoming increasingly, yeah, increasingly like that, which is good news for all of us here, because it, it means that there's opportunities out there that can be, you know, that can be grasped if we have the imagination and the drive to go get them. So, yeah. And um, it's nice that you mentioned the prop tech and the startups because we're very lucky to have today uh, two panelists from startups who managed to raise funding in the middle of pandemic, which is uh, very impressive. Congratulations. Uh, so I think the audience and all of us would be very happy to, to learn a bit more about your experience. Uh, so maybe starting with Francois, like how was it um, growing a startup and fundraising uh, amidst the COVID outbreak? Um... Yeah, so um, it, it was uh, it was uh, quite quite a journey, uh, but I think like raising funds is uh, is always like that. Um, uh, during the the lockdown, because we we raised so five five million uh, euros uh, in Series A uh, during uh, the first lockdown, and we and we did all the roadshow uh, uh, with uh, so AXA Venture Partner, which is uh, the, the fund that uh, invests uh, in a notch. Uh, we did all the, the road show uh, during the, the lockdown, so we did uh, everything uh, on uh, on video. Um, so it was quite strange because uh, we let people that we have never seen uh, invest in uh, our company, but um, it was. Um, I think many companies were in difficulties at, this, at that moment, and be able to keep growing during this uh, pandemic. And to have investors um, uh, that are ready to take the risk to invest in a startup that is working uh, on the market that is deeply impacted by the crisis uh, is um, a very good proof of confidence um, from them. Uh, so for us, it was a uh, um, yeah a very good proof that our model and what we are uh, trying to, to build. Uh, at Unlatch uh, is something uh, uh, that has a real future. Uh, so, so that's 
that's where, how we went during the this first uh, lockdown. And was, so we signed the the, the final um, contract uh, shareholder agreement with the, the fund uh, on June. And so we just we, we first um, uh, we have the opportunity to see our investors for the first time uh, during the, the final signature uh, that we we did digitally, but uh, in the same uh, in the same place to, to be able to, to meet uh, each other. So it, it was quite quite strange, but it was a uh, it was a good proof of confidence from uh, them and for us as well uh, that we that we put uh, into uh, into this fund. Amazing! Congratulations! And Victor, uh, how was your experience? And maybe if you have any uh, tips going forward, because it seems like we're probably going to be in this situation <laughs> for some time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been both uh, exhausting because you need to have this like increased energy to go through uh, everything we had to go through. Uh, so it's been exhausting, but thrilling. And just to 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 add uh, to Francois's point, I think that the the key change between raising funds between like during the pandemic or before is that before there was a lot of capital and you didn't really have to take into account dimensions such as well what we call smart money. It's better to have smart money, but there was so much capital that basically it was almost falling from the tree. Um, here, what has been super exciting is that the, the, the crisis has forced us to align with our new investors, with our historical and new investors on two other dimensions. First one is how do you react during the crisis and just people react very differently and some are risk takers and it's better when you're investing in vc uh, some are a bit less risk takers and i think that the first thing which has been great is that we've been aligning uh, both our new investors and for instance you know Vest and robin and us uh, we've been we, we've had an opportunity which was ideal to align on the risk level that we wanted this is one thing and the second thing is that when you're in the middle of such a crisis uh, where you don't exactly know where things are going to, how things are going to, to, to end up and to settle. I think that vision is the most important thing that you, that you need to have. And it's essential to align on the vision. And you can tell me, yes, but well, when you raise funds, you talk about the vision and you always align on the vision with the, with the investors. Well, yes, obviously, but I think it's especially key when you're in the middle of a crisis, which is indeed impacting your sector. So the two great things about this, about raising funds during the crisis, and we, we, signed in the, we signed the final document in uh, September, mid-September, um, is that you can really get to know who you're dealing with and, and just, I think, make sure that it will work even better than if you had raised um, in another period of time. But I don't know, Robin, I'm curious to, I know it's not my, my spot to ask questions, but... Uh... Uh, it's, what, 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 it's when the crisis happens that you see which companies you really love, and uh, and regarding Comet, we 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 met uh, with Victor and the team uh, before the crisis, uh, and uh, we decided to invest uh, uh, just after the, the first uh, lockdown. Uh, we know that we could suffer a second wave, a second lockdown, maybe a third one. We don't know. I I don't hope, but. We don't know, but we we are a long-term investor. We we are in, we invest in company for six to seven years, maybe uh, and even uh, even longer in, in, in some cases. Um, so we really think that the company is uh, is surfing a super trend, the reinvention of uh, of the office, and so we are able to uh, to pass over uh, the the short-term uh, difficulties uh, that could that result from uh, from the lockdown and uh, and the crisis so uh, i think uh, it's a crisis uh, uh, in ancient greek uh, greek is uh, like uh, the synonym of uh, test and choice and i think it's a good time to 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 choose uh, pick up uh, the, the best companies uh, just to, to add something to what uh, robin said uh, it's also for entrepreneurs the possibility, and as Victor said, before the lockdown, there was a lot of money uh, to in the, in the market, uh, and it was quite easy to raise money from anybody. Um, and for entrepreneurs, it's also the opportunity to see uh, who are the good investors that um, 
can see this um, um, after this crisis, can see the long term uh, and see the deep mutation in the market you are working, uh, working, working on and are just not looking at your numbers for uh, uh, this month. Uh, we are in March, you are not doing uh, the business plan, uh, so uh, I won't invest in, in you. Uh, this one you can uh, you can skip them and uh, and go on those who, who see with the more um, uh, deep uh, mutation and deep vision you have for your your company. So uh, it's also helpful for entrepreneurs to to be able to see who are the really good investors and all the investors where the, the we had the opportunity to to see during uh, this first lockdown was the one who were still uh, willing to work with uh, startups even during those uh, difficult days. Great. Um, thank you so much for this um, amazing insights. Um, I think the time now... Can, to I, can, yes. I, can I say just one really quick thing? I'm just uh, very interested to hear what both of you guys said about, uh, about the crisis. Robin, you said that um, crisis is the Greek for decision. If you write crisis in Chinese, it takes two characters. And uh, the first one is danger. And the second one is opportunity, right? So there's a there's a there's clearly an opportunity around uh, around where we're at now. I agree with what you guys say. I think um, companies that can demonstrate resilience can really get ahead of the pack at this time. I did want to mention just something really quick um, about what we do at Schneider with uh, innovative startup companies, prop tech, and otherwise. We've lots of programs, lots of ways that we can collaborate together. We're certainly moving from a pure manufacturer mindset towards uh, building out our ecosystem and in that uh, in that aspect um, we have a marketplace called exchange it's completely free we currently have about 50,000 people on it we get end users coming on we have technology suppliers everybody comes together it's system integrators and what we do is we put a certain amount of material up there which helps people train up so you can upskill when you're locked down as I like to say upskill when you're locked down get more information about uh, sustainability energy management things like that we put analytics kits for free up there which can help you improve your digital tools right so you can you can get you can move faster develop faster using some of these things the platform is called exchange i think you guys are going to get an email afterwards about this but we're very very happy to have startups come into this and one very nice success story which is also a french story um, we had a startup who joined exchange last year and their first international project came through our exchange platform and we're very proud of that so so you're more than welcome to join that and uh, and become part of a, a broader Schneider family. Sorry, Evgenia. Of course, no, that's, uh, I'm sure many people will find it very helpful. And um, yes, as Cormac mentioned, we will share a follow-up email with um, the contact details of our panelists in case you want to reach out to them directly. And uh, now I'd like to take some questions from the audience. So as I mentioned in the beginning, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, in your Zoom, and we will try to answer all of them. Uh, so I see we already have the first question uh, to Cormac uh, about the um, impact of 5G um, and whether it will be the change that moves uh, things forward. Yeah, I, I'm happy to take that really quickly, Evgen. I don't want to monopolize, but yeah, thank you for that question about 5G. Um, so just for everybody listen, I'm sure you guys know there are there must be about 50 different wireless protocols, right? There's 50 different ways that you can get a, an object to communicate remotely from whether it be in a building or a factory or whatever. And there are lots, there's no real consensus on what that, what the best protocol is. Um, your question is an interesting one. Is 5G going to be the, the game changer? What I would say is, I think it's definitely going to help us accelerate because once you have consensus, uh, on a standard, it helps everybody just focus straight away on what that new standard is. So if, and this is an if, right? If 5G is really the wireless protocol in five years time and all the others disappear, then yeah, it, it could be a big help because that's what's happened in, if you look at IT, everybody in IT agreed on IPv6 a couple of years ago. And now we have a system, all right? So IV, IPv6 is a, is a framework that allows, it, it is scaled, for, well, I think it's 10,000 connected devices for every person on the planet, right? So it's it's supposed to, it is designed to scale to human colonization of Mars, right? That's the idea they have when they build IPv6. 5G, if it's the same thing for buildings, 
then whoop de doo yes, it will save everybody time and money, and we'll get to that 100% efficiency uh, number that I talked about earlier much more quickly. Remains to be seen, right? I don't have a crystal ball, so we'll see. But it, it would help, but I'm not, sure, I'm not so sure it's the game changer. I think the game changer is more the flattening of the overall ecosystem. How do we get everybody collaborating digitally? It's, it's, some of the technologies around building information modeling, very, very interesting at the moment where you get you know, architects, developers, contractors, everybody, design firms, all working together off the same blueprints. Some of that will be blockchain, um, uh, blockchain accredited or authenticated, sorry, is the word. So that's game changing technology too, right? So, uh, but, but a lot of the, where I'm really looking is integration. The, the, the better the integrations I see in some of these really smart buildings that we're working on, that's really where you see that you can measure how far we're coming in terms of a, a journey. Sorry to bore everybody with technology. So yeah, don't get me started. I'll, I'll move for the next question. That's, uh, that's exciting because I think that's um, really important what you're saying that not one single player can push the innovation forward, but it's um, an ecosystem of uh, different uh, parties working together it can really 100%. make things change. Uh, yes. We have another question for Robin. Um, what role do you think uh, IoT will play in property management for a small mom and pop uh, landlords? Uh, the the, the rental management uh, is a complicated industry. I, I mean, uh, over the, the past few years, a lot of startups have tried to, to disrupt the, this mom and pop uh, industry uh, by, uh, by trying to uh, introduce new tech, uh, especially IoT. But uh, uh, I think it's very complicated and the scale effects are not so obvious that uh, it, it seems to be uh, at first sight. Um, and uh, in most countries, it's particularly uh, true in France, but uh, it's also uh, true in Germany and in over uh, developed markets in, uh, in Europe, you have to compete with large incumbents uh, often uh, fin funded by LBO funds, uh, I, I think to uh, Foncia in France, for instance, and these uh, traditional uh, legacy players have invested heavily uh, amounts of money uh, to digitalize their uh, own IT systems. Uh, so the um, startups are uh, have uh, some some in some markets, but. Uh, um, most I've seen startups have some difficulties because tech is not enough um, uh, dif uh, differentiator to, uh, to, to gain uh, market shares. And they are increasingly, increasingly uh, under pressure of legacy uh, leaders and players who are, who are able to, to uh, in innovate and use, uh, use tech. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, Victor, we have a question for you. Uh, do you think the WeWork model is sustainable as it is? I know we can probably have a whole session on that, but <laughs> well, I'll let you respond. Oh, um, yeah, well, uh, if you want the, the, the short answer, I think that co the co-working model can be sustainable. The only thing is that um, when you take a, if you look at it very simply, you need to, you need to make sure that you can, can make your customers pay a premium and that your costs are well contained. The issue is when you get there too aggressively, uh, or maybe in a market with a bit more, uh, with like too much combat some competition, and and let's say that you need to to have a two x on your rent. You need to make twice as revenues as many revenues as you as as your rent. Let's say this in a market with a lot of competition. Of course, it's not going to be twofold. It's going to be times one point point seven or point eight. So. You have this on one side and on the other side, if you're aggressively developing your real estate uh, network and you're willing to pay um, premium on rent, then obviously the spread between your rent and what you actually make out of it is going to be even thinner. So I'm not answering about WeWork or other companies. I'm just saying that it's a model which is uh, a cost model, actually. A cost, uh, it's a model which needs to ensure a huge solidity on both the top line and the bottom line. And especially in the bottom line, since the main cost is, is the rent, making sure that the right assets are, are, um, are leased. Right, 
Uh, thank you for that. Um, we have another question. Um, we are witnessing massive e-commerce growth. How do you see the impact of last mile logistics on residential buildings? Uh, so maybe Etienne, you probably have some uh, view on um, the development of e-commerce, retail and logistics. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think I think that we're at a point where the uh, the last mile infrastructure in terms of commercial real estate is is already pretty well um, built up. Um, I don't think there's there are huge revolution uh, to come from the uh, the commercial real estate sector. I think it's more in terms of um, urban planning and how the cities uh, build and rebuild themselves um, that they have to allow for some. Uh, really urban logistics space, uh, probably tailored to, uh, uh, to a different model of, of delivery, um, probably more reliant on um, uh, electric cargo bikes uh, rather than uh, white vans uh, for delivery. Uh, but at this point, I'd say it's in the hands of the cities um, to, to create uh, a favorable environment uh, to make it worthwhile uh, for logistics operator um, to build this infrastructure. Um, great, thank you for this um, insight. We have another question on the, um, uh, the sustainability. Um, so you mentioned, uh, many of you, uh, sustainability is a major topic in real estate, uh, especially in the commercial space. But to what extent does this go beyond energy and efficiency consideration and into topics like the circular economy and materials? Whoever wants to take the question, please. I'm very happy to take that if you want. I mean, yeah, obviously energy is uh, is part of it, uh, but what I think is very interesting is if you look at the uh, if you look at the let's look at the regulatory and certification environment, right, and how that's that landscape is changing. It's changing significantly. Uh, if you want a lead platinum building, it doesn't. It's not enough to just have. Uh, exemplary energy efficiency or energy management in the building. You need to cover off a lot of other topics. Uh, and one of those gravitates around the way people experience the building, so the actual human experience of the building. So we recognize the fact that if you have, you know, there is a fundamental, uh, what would I say, fundamental conflict of interest here. You, if you turn off the HVAC system in a building, uh, you could have a fantastic energy efficiency level, but People won't want to come in because it's not the right temperature, right? So, so you need to. What we're seeing is sustainability is growing, right? It's 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 morphing into a broader concept, something maybe like ESG or whatever. I think there's a recognition that we need to move multiple topics forward, multiple conversations forward at the same time. You can't just green an asset. You have to simultaneously make it more attractive. For the occupant make it more experiential it's much like what victor is talking about um and you also need to make it healthier right so we need to you know uh and there are certifications for that like well certification which include pathogen uh pr protection from pathogens and elimination of airborne pathogens that's part of the well label and well is now under the overall umbrella of usgbc which also has lead so we can see how all this is converging into one you know, one sort of a, an amalgam, amalgamation of a good building. You know, that's basically what it is. What's a good building? Well, a good building is going to be good for people. We say it's good for people, it's good for planet, it's good for profitability. That's a pretty good, uh, you know, a pretty good way to look at it, I think. If, if it's helping all of us, all the entire chain, right, corporate occupiers, landlords, service providers, everybody, if it's making everybody profitable, it's good for the planet and uh, the people in the buildings are happy. I think we're pretty much on to a winner. So that's a short, hopefully, short answer to that question. Yeah, it's getting bigger. And it's uh, probably related to the, uh, another question we have about the impact of the sustainability initiatives in real estate sector on the economy in the long run. So I think you mentioned before that buildings are very inefficient and consume 30, 40% of energy. And uh, yeah, we know how much room there is to make them more efficient, more digital, more sustainable, right? So I think, yeah, if you, if you want to talk about the economy, uh, so I can quote Jeremy Rifkin, right? He was a very, uh, let's say, a listened to researcher and professor and influencer globally, right? He's a published author. 
um, like he says, the biggest destruction of value in the coming decades will be the $100 trillion of stranded fossil fuel assets, right? So what's going to replace that? And the exciting thing about the new economy that we're moving into, the new digital and electrical future, right? There's going to be increased electrification, increased distributed energy resources, we call them, more solar, right? We're hitting that tipping point where solar is cheaper as an energy source than anything else. We're getting there, right? We're halving the price of a kilowatt hour from solar energy every couple of years at this stage. So uh, exciting times where buildings will no longer just be destinations for people. They will no longer be, you know, financial instruments that we can play around with. It's They'll also become miniature power stations generating energy for themselves and also energy for the the broader neighborhood, right? And selling energy on to other stakeholders in microgrids. So you're asking how that will affect the global economy. Yeah, it's going to be, it's an interesting time, right? But the, the stakes for corporates, if we look at the corporates according to the Carbon Disclosure Project, um, 17 of the biggest corporates in the world sat down and talked about the risks related to sustainability, talked about carbon stranding, right? Uh, the financial risk estimated over the next 10 years was about a trillion dollars to those 17 companies, right? So when we talk about the financial stakes, they're absolutely uh, massive, they're considerable. And they're considerable enough that we are pretty confident that this is going to affect uh, lasting change in the way that, you know, buildings happen and not just buildings. Robin, you talked about mobility. You know, it's there's a big, big, big change coming. And uh, COVID is a sort of a blip. It's a wake up call, a speed bump. But the bigger changes are around climate and, uh, and digital transformation, right? So, yeah, exciting times. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm, I'm just conscious of time. So if uh, any of our panelists would like to share some um, um, last comments, uh, that would be great. Um, do, do you want to share anything? Or if not, we can wrap it up um, for today. OK, uh, great. So thank you so much for this insightful discussion. I'm sure our audience enjoyed learning more about your views and very interesting examples uh, you shared with us today. Um, as uh, I mentioned before, we will send and follow up email with um, your details and anything you would like to share with the audience so that uh, people from the audience can get in touch with you directly and ask uh, any follow up questions and maybe have some uh, productive collaboration. Uh, thanks a lot to everyone and stay tuned for our next edition of PropTech Connect. Uh, merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Thank you very, very much, Virginia. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Goodbye. Everyone. Bye. Thanks.